All right, and we are recording. And folks, as mentioned before, any questions, drop in the Q&A box. But uh, Takeo, I just want to give a quick intro for you. You're very accomplished. You've done amazing stuff. But just want to share, for folks who don't know you and need to connect with you, so you know, you're a software engineer. You're based in beautiful Portland, Oregon. Yeah, very nice. Um, and you come to Pulsar from the Apache Flink stream processing side of things. Um, mm -hmm. And folks, if you want to connect with uh, Kato at all, you know, go on Twitter, um, C-A-I-T-O underscore 200 underscore OK, and uh, we'll be able to connect with you there. So whenever you're ready, go ahead, take it away. <laughs> Great. Rosalie, thank you so much. That was a great introduction. I appreciate it. Oh, oh we're um, excited to have you. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> good. I'm very excited to be here. So yeah, so thanks. Um, hi, everybody. It's really good to be here. Um, it's great to be uh, invited to be part of the Pulsar community today. So super stoked about that. And welcome to Streaming Fast and Slow. Uh, this is going to be about how to successfully be an early adopter of stream processing at your company with a particular focus on integration, operations, and analytics. So my name is Kato Schur. Um, as Rosalie mentioned, I'm a software engineer in Portland, Oregon, and I have a variety of hobbies, including woodworking, dance, and running. And uh, also, she mentioned, I come to Apache Pulsar from the stream processing side, um, starting with Apache Flink, which I first started working with in 2017. And I'm here because of the experiences that I've had as an early adopter of stream processing, specifically in, for this case, at my old company, using it for a top tier project. And I wanna talk about what I learned about successfully integrating a new streaming application into a complex non-streaming ecosystem and doing that on a short timeline. This talk will be very applicable to anyone who wants to use Pulsar with a stream processing framework like Flink. Um, but some of the concepts will also be applicable to integrating Pulsar alone into something like a complex legacy ecosystem. Uh, this talk is also about early adoption and into the, that larger technical ecosystem. And if you want to learn more about specifically using Pulsar with stream processing framework like Flink, um, Seth Wiseman has an awesome looking keynote tomorrow for unified data processing um, with Flink and Pulsar. So definitely check that out. So I'll start with some background, our use case, and what some of the challenges were. Next, I'll go over integrating stream processing into that non-stream processing ecosystem. And I really love this part. It's kind of the, the fun moment where the people problems and tech problems really get most in hand in hand. Then I'll go over operations. And lastly, I'll cover analytics, focusing on monitoring and alerting, which I really love geeking out about. Uh, before I go into background, though, this is a good time to set some definitions. I'm referring to my team here as early adopters, but that can mean different things to different people. In this context, I'm mainly referring to being the first person or first team at your company that's using, that's, you know, for instance, building a Pulsar or stream processing app, particularly in production use. It's also a good time to mention that unfortunately, the project that I'm referring to for my use case in this talk is not open source. Please still feel free to reach out to me about things, but there's some proprietary stuff I may not be able to go into. Okay, so on a high level, this project was to create a new data pipeline to organize, track, and store customer usage information in a way that was highly secure and could be queried for in real time by various tools. On the logistical side, this is a top tier system that would need to interact with every single product at the whole company and a variety of other apps and services, particularly those involving accounts or subscriptions. In terms of people in process, there's the familiar story of a tight deadline and a small team but this one had the additional complications of also it being at a company that was completely new to the framework we had selected and was also relatively new to stream processing in general. So here's an example of what customers might see. This represents usage for a particular account with subscriptions for various products. This only so shows three out of, uh, at the time that we were developing, it was about seven products. So just imagine that you can scroll down there. So it needs to be accurate because it's closely tied to billing. It would need to be accessible in near real time because customers, sales, et cetera, may need to check their usage at any time and on a really granular level. You know, how many minutes they were connected to a product, how many CPU did they use with the last hour for another product, et cetera. As for throughput, this just shows one customer who could have data for seven plus products. Uh, some have multiple units of measurement, data retention specifications, and subscription tiers. 
Add in the fact that there's a lot of metadata about a lot of this, and then of course multiply that by a huge number of customers. So we needed a system that could handle this rapid growth and sustainably handle it for the foreseeable future. Luckily, there's frameworks out there. That's, I think, why we're all here at this conference. Um, and you know, being able to hear about how that can solve for all these challenges in really powerful, impressive ways. Um, so problem solved, right? And in the end, yes, actually, very genuinely, yes. Um, we, we were able to find frameworks that were able to solve all of these complicated problems, and that was awesome. Um, but that's not why I'm here to talk to you, because in order to even use the features that would end up solving, solving all of our problems, we would need to integrate this new application into that large, complex, pre-existing ecosystem that may not be prepared at all for the impact that a powerful, fast stream processing framework like that would have on it. So we knew that we would need to compensate for certain operational costs, like storage capacity for storing state. And since we picked Apache Flink, storing things like save points, since those don't automatically get cleaned up by the framework. However, we may not have been, pre have been prepared for how much we would need to factor in the use cases of our dependent and upstream apps into our program design and configuration. Okay, so why streaming fast and slow? Firstly, I wanna talk about speed. One of the main reasons people love Pulsar, Flink, and some of the other most popular pub sub and stream processing frameworks is because they optimize for low latency and can consume and process data obscenely fast. Pulsar, as well as Kafka, can process over 2 million writes per second. Apache Flink and Apache Spark can both process tens of millions of records per second. All of this is, of course, awesome. So these frameworks can enable you to stream data through at top speed. Cool. But this means that the first problem we encountered was, as the engineering team, how do we keep up with something that, that's this fast? <clears throat> So for me, it was sort of like training for a really big sporting event, like a marathon for your very first time. I actually had a great example of this happen to me last August, you know, in the before times where we could go outside with people. <clears throat> As I mentioned, one of my hobbies is running and I signed up for a multiple day relay race with thousands of other runners across half the state of Oregon. I also may have signed up late and had about two weeks to train. So when we're talking about that type timeline, great analogy. Uh, the race was like nothing I'd ever done before. I would need to run on multiple different types of terrain, different temperatures, different times of day. I would need to navigate areas I've never been to and coordinate with lots of other people running before and after me. And I would need to be able to integrate well with the many streams of people running alongside me. I had to come to terms with the fact that just because I'm a runner does not mean I'm prepared for this special kind of race. Like, how just because my team was full of talented engineers and had healthy applications didn't mean we were automatically prepared for jumping in and keeping up with a new super fast stream processing framework at that scale. But it also didn't mean that we couldn't do it or even that we couldn't do it on that super tight timeline. It just meant we had to be aware that there was going to be extra requirements needed in order to keep up and that we had to be way more aware of who and what is running alongside us than we would normally have to be. In both scenarios, it wasn't just about understanding the technical concepts of the new framework or being a skilled engineer or athlete. Instead, most of the work revolved around getting creative around the impact on the surrounding system and using that information to streamline some very preventable hurdles in the integration process. For the marathon race, I had to completely reevaluate how I trained. I had to prepare to integrate the aspects of running that I was familiar with into a large, complicated event that involved lots of other teams running in parallel to us. I would need to run in a way that could be made compatible with their processes and meet the standards of the event system as a whole. My entire team had to be aware of their running patterns and understand how to address issues that came up with the teams that were running upstream of us in the route. In both scenarios, we had of course had to strengthen some communication processes within the team, but more importantly, we had to be able to communicate really, really well with other teams that we normally would not interact with at all on a normal daily jog, for instance, because just by nature of there being such an ongoing stream of runners and that stream contained so many runners, we had to recognize that our presence would now be impacting those teams in ways we never had before. I had to invest in completely new running gear as part of this analogy. My old gear and other resources that I used in the past had been fine when I was running in small batches, but we're not necessarily going to be able to hold up to this new situation. 
When I had been running in small batches with time to stop, check my progress, and readjust, there were certain resources I could just skip if it were inconvenient, like wearing the right shoes or even getting the right hydration or fuel. But of course, if you're running anything continuously, you have to figure out ways to check your progress and readjust your gear while you're still running. And of course, to be able to do so often if needed and sustainably. And even if my old gear did miraculously hold up for such a seemingly endless stream of running, is it worth it to just merely hold up? Or is it worth investing in resources that you feel confident will be able to scale with you, ones that can really keep up with that full potential for power and speed? Additionally, in this analogy, we were running through uncharted territory with no cell phone reception, which means no existing way to track our progress for that area. So we need to reevaluate how we monitored our runner's health and performance and how and when we would alert on any issues like seeing a stop in progress. So again, in this analogy, maybe you're a really experienced engineer. Maybe you've even worked with other really powerful, fast, really athletic streaming frameworks before. Maybe your applications are really healthy and have been in good shape enough to accommodate other really impressive changes and other new technologies. The engineering team that I was on was also comprised of very experienced engineers like this, and most of our apps were also in, in very good shape. However, just like in the relay race, we found that in order to keep up with the speed of the stream processing framework like Flink, and this is especially the case if you're combining it with uh, an app like Pulsar, formerly like Pulsar, and especially when integrating our new service into something so large and complex, we still had to really slow down and make sure that we can make those adjustments really conscientiously. We had to be particularly careful in this case about how we impacted the tech ecosystem around us. Could the non-streaming sources upstream and downstream uh, and our sync, you know, where the data ends up, in our case, internal data stores, actually be able to handle that new continuous stream? And could the ecosystem of people and teams around us be able to troubleshoot any issues that came up if they're not familiar with stream processing concepts or Flink concepts or Pulsar concepts? We had to drastically adjust our gear, our resources like our container configurations, memory allocation, et cetera. And this one might seem obvious because, of course, allocating these resources is often a really integral part of the basic getting started steps if you want to build your new streaming app. But of course, and of course, you want to set yourself up for continuing to scale. But we had to be extra clear with stakeholders and others who may be in charge of approving those resources that we'd requested especially if they're unfamiliar with stream processing, then we would not only need more than what was actually required by that basic setup for a single isolated streaming application, but we would likely need more ownership as well of those resources than we would have needed for any of our previous applications. Or at the very least, if someone else is in charge of those resources, time would need to be spent to make sure that we could get them familiar with those basic concepts of both the framework of stream processing of your app's use case, because you'll likely be using those resources in ways that are completely different from how they've been used before or by other teams. So for us, we needed to be able to allocate extra resources and have more autonomy over them and be able to handle, of course, those potential data spikes if the stream stops and starts unexpectedly and any other issues that we normally would not have had to deal with with previous applications. And finally, we were in our charted territory. Since we couldn't stop and examine that well-defined batch of data once it had already been processed, or wait until the records were successfully written out to our data store at the end of the pipeline, we needed to find better ways of looking inside that pipeline to monitor that throughput latency and any potential unexpected stops or spikes before they became an issue, of course. So this would have been less of an issue if we hadn't had so many teams writing to our pipeline. But of course, each additional topic we needed to merge in meant more work. And I don't just mean because of the increased technical complexity, or because of the increased throughput. Of course, those are still issues, but those are more predictable. For us, in many other, sim and of course, many similar use cases, the challenge was, the, was that these topics are owned by different teams, which added an unpredictable complexity for us. And this is particularly the case for things like testing and analytics. So, starting with that integration. So, as we're integrating into that technical ecosystem, we found, unfortunately, that some of the best features of stream processing for our team can also be the biggest drawbacks for teams that interact with us. Ouch. <laughs> so firstly, if you're unifying streams of data owned by different teams, you may find that some teams who thought they all treated their data the same don't actually treat them all the same. 
And honestly, we found it was actually just best to assume that each team may be treating their data differently from the next. And I'll go into more of that a bit later. In our case, we had, to, we had very specific needs for aggregating data and for exactly what that needed to look like. And not all teams were able to implement logic fast enough on their ends to sufficiently adhere to our schema before we launched. So we had to factor that into our time design. We created an additional Flink application that provided aggregation calculations on the data, the data that still needed it, that is. So we didn't have to depend on other teams in finding the time. And this wasn't just an, an issue of extra engineering hours spent on coding. This meant we now had a complicated ownership problem. We had to get really creative about how we split up who owned pre-aggregated data for which teams, and subsequently, who was responsible for alerting and monitoring on it. This, in turn, meant that we had to become a lot more familiar with other teams' domain in order to have context for even the smallest slice of their system that we monitored for. And I want to really emphasize that for some of the biggest hurdles we had, the best resolutions came from us as the engineers optimizing for that understanding of our impact on other teams' domain and letting that data inform our, basically our whole architecture and design process. Otherwise, you could end up with last minute at the last minute with data that's in a form that's unusable to you, you could end up with no one wanting to take ownership of monitoring and consequently insufficient insight into your data and worse, insufficient alerts, which of course, if you're carrying the pager for that service is uh, it's not so fun. Um, and this leads me to some other related issues with being an early adopter. I wanna talk about creating and automating a community within your company for the new technology you're adopting and how this is one of the best ways that we found to mitigate a lot of these roadblocks and really just make sure that we had more time to focus on our engineering work. So we're impacting teams in other ways we haven't before. Okay, we're also using shared resources like AWS buckets and internal container and deployment tools in ways that they had not been used before either. This meant we needed to understand other teams' applications better than we normally have to. It also meant that other teams, leaders, architects, et cetera, suddenly had to be very familiar with our monitoring and know at least some basic stream processing and in our case Flink, possibly in your case Pulsar concepts, so they could understand our monitoring. What do I mean by automating an internal community? So if we had addressed each inter-team related work issue as it came up, this would be a long and painful process that would keep us away from our engineering work. And we found that the heart of most of these issues were all the same engineers having to repeatedly advocate for or explain our system or Flink or Pulsar concepts. This though meant that we could easily automate a resolution for these issues and make a virtuous cycle of information sharing through firstly, creating a safe space for others to experiment with the new streaming technology we're adopting, as well as providing interactive documentation and of course having a good detailed map. And here's where the running analogy gets almost a little too literal. So my team for the relay race were also coworkers at the same company in different orgs though. So my running team and my engineering team both used the same internal platform to both create blog posts that both covered the same two topics, including we both had how to manuals for anyone that was interested in training like my running team or creating their own Flink cluster and how to integrate that with internal tools. Um, each team also had an overview of the project with a glossary of terms which was incredibly important, actually. Uh, we also both chose that to have the blog format so that people from other teams, leadership, et cetera, could ask questions and provide advice in the comments and be able to actually follow along if there's updates. Super simple, super effective. Sharing these saved us a ton of time and in having to explain what, what the heck we were working on in both cases. So as for supporting that experimentation, both for the launch of the marathon race and for the launch of our new streaming application, my team in both cases created accessible chat rooms to support people who are experimenting with or wanting to get help with something that's new to them. In both cases, people would ask each other questions about where resources, what progress monitoring tools other people had tried. Um, they would ask if anyone wanted to collaborate on training sessions together. People would encourage each other for how well their sessions went, commiserated with them when experiment failed, inevitably. And it sounds really basic because it is, but that's what we found was an incredibly important baseline in order for us to cultivate a group of people 
who could feel comfortable doing their own work to become more knowledgeable and who became increasingly more enthusiastic about participating and helping each other out. And they became some of our best advocates within the company, which alleviated a huge amount of, of friction. In the end, uh, my team was actually able to lean on this community for help with a ton of different issues. And I can't emphasize enough how essential it was that we created that community early on with really minimal engineering hours spent on that whatsoever. And how much this helped us distribute the burden of getting unstuck on a whole variety of issues throughout the duration of the project, which is of course particularly important as we got close to the launch. And I wasn't able to share the internal work Slack. So here's a screenshot from the running uh, Slack. So just to replace elevation game with messages per second and miles for let's say pulsar topics and you can, uh, you can basically swap them out. Thirdly, uh, of course, always take a good map. So in both cases, uh, for our analogy and for our uh, engineering, it really wasn't just about having a map of the pathway from start to finish, but it was essential that we clarify the integration points along the way. So other teams could quickly assess where they were and who they impacted, particularly in case of an emergency. With each more detailed iteration of the map, other teams that interacted with us were able to become more and more autonomous, which was great. Uh, another essential map that we used was having a flowchart for incident response and triage. And uh, we did this for both cases. So if you get lost in the woods and end up running in a circle, which did happen to someone, or your Flink application stops and instead of restarting successfully, begins a cycle for minutes on end, totally didn't happen, <laughs> um, you know, scary stuff. So in both cases, those incident response flowcharts were as simple as we could possibly make them. Just ridiculously simple because that's exactly what you need if you get lost at three in the morning either way. So this brings us to operations. Most people here probably have a pretty good idea of the main operational drawbacks or risks of Pulsar and compatible stream processing frameworks, uh, like for instance, possibly having additional storage needs. Particularly with frameworks like Flink, where you might be storing things like save points in a different way than you're storing your elements like your state snapshots or checkpoints. And even if you're not running Pulsar with Flink, but you're running it on its own, this is still can be very applicable, particularly if your company is not already using tools like Bookkeeper or something similar, or if they're not familiar at all, actually. I've seen that a lot. So uh, most well-architected stream processing frameworks have features, they've got workarounds to make this pretty easily remedied. And there's lots of awesome information readily available on that. So for the sake of time, I'm not really gonna go into that. But for us, we had even planned for how well our new framework was gonna integrate technically with those internal tools that we'd be using that we knew we had support for. A lot of our choices specifically had to do with how well it would work with um, Mesos and Zookeeper, which we'd been using internally there. But because this is a large company and this is a fairly common problem, um, you may have operations separated into specialized teams. So we still had issues with the fact that just because these tools are technically compatible, doesn't mean that they're configured in a way that's gonna be helpful to us. It also meant that we had no control over reconfiguring them and that they might be a shared resource, in which case reconfiguration can be incredibly slow because it needs to involve a lot of other teams that normally you wouldn't really have to relate to at all. Uh, internal deployment tools are probably one of the most common examples I've seen of this. And something it is something that we also had to find a workaround for. Since we didn't own our deploy tools, which you know is, is fairly common, and deployment, of course, is also used by just about every team in, for, in most cases, reconfiguring those for our use case was a very arduous product process. So we personally worked around this by creating and owning a deploy script in the beginning so that we could get started while we worked on a more automated long-term solution. Uh, at first, this included manually uploading the script. We were then able to hook into the tools and using a hook that, uh, that we did have to write ourselves. So lastly, analytics, my, my favorite part, actually. So with the running analogy, it was important to make sure that monitoring was well coordinated between teams and stakeholders. In this case, stakeholders could be the rest of your team uh, who's running ahead of you or behind you or your family who's following your progress on a running app that's streaming your GPS signal to them in real time, which was pretty awesome actually. So during the relay race, my personal stakeholders were my family and they were remotely following my progress on this app and when my progress suddenly stopped and disappeared at three in the morning with no way of alerting them, um, those were some very unhappy stakeholders and none of us wants unhappy stakeholders. 
So although my running team learned that we really needed better monitoring for progress within those running routes, like in your pipeline, it helped that they at least knew what the normal pace was for each runner. And this gave them a reasonable threshold to know when to alert if a certain duration of time had passed without seeing that runner exit the pipeline or the route. Luckily, my engineering team had made several features to compensate for this, including creating a unique field to key data on for the pipeline. There's great ways also of leveraging um, watermarks so you can you know, really optimize for checking on either end of the pipeline as well. Uh, in the stream processing scenario, stakeholders often ended up being, of course, teams that own the applications that are upstream and downstream. As I said earlier, we found that we had to be so much more familiar with particularly the upstream applications than we had to be for any of our old batch apps. And this was particularly true for any apps that had really sensitive alerting around increases or pauses in data flow, especially if we're relying on their alerting to signify any issues that might impact us. They, they just may not align. So as for ensuring that those teams understood our monitoring though, honestly, this was about less than 45 minutes of relabeling some dashboards, posting those in our stakeholder Slack channel for them. For instance, we may need to monitor spikes in, th in throughput from a particular source, like one of our incoming Kafka topics, but the data coming in from that source only affects one of our downstream teams. So it's, it was just about kind of making sure that the labeling was clear enough that that team knew which one of these many, many graphs actually applies to them and that they will actually check it too. So like in the running analogy, as I mentioned, in a multi-day relay race, issues like unexpected stops in progress could signify a really serious issue. So it was imperative to have a way to monitor and alert on this. It was also important to understand the typical pace of runner, as I mentioned. Uh, and of course, in the stream processing case, it's, it was equally important to know what a normal pace looks like for that application. But of course, this is in regards to lag, throughput, et cetera. Uh, we found that it really wasn't sufficient to have a good enough gut feeling about that and what is normal and abnormal. We really had to make sure the whole team understood what that normal looks like on an incredibly granular level. We found that previously our other non-streaming applications really didn't need that much. Uh, we could just kind of go with that gut feeling. And even for projects with a lot of integration points, it was easy to have just the engineering team be familiar with our analytics and really only for just those core applications. However, since we started combining unbounded streams of data, as well as that higher risk of the data coming in in multiple formats, or really even just having such a variety of different throughput rates being produced by our upstream teams, sure, I mean, we could have kept going and, and without changing how we monitor our application and our integration points, but we found that being aware at that level of the full pipeline suddenly became so much more essential if we wanted to be that much more successful and if we really wanted to be able to keep developing at velocity. So the slide here is a fake example made for talks, but it represents the very real type of alerting that we used. So let's say each graph represents throughput for one product. And each of these products is upstream of our data pipeline. Initially, we were alerting on any spike in throughput over a certain threshold. However, in this example, it turned out that the spike in throughput at the 9.10 to 9.15 a.m. time slot is actually normal and expected for all three of these products based on how and when these three all receive their data throughout the day. As I mentioned, some of, even though you're streaming, some of your upstream apps, maybe they're doing batch, maybe they're writing at different points of the day. It would be a huge pain to be alerted on this every day for three separate products at 9.10 a.m., especially say if that spike is maybe at like midnight, so it was, it was just so important to work closely with those teams on this because it was, it's pretty easy to just calculate the, those thresholds based purely on throughput patterns that you may have seen previously. And we found it was just so much worth it to get way more detailed than that. We found that through delving deeper into their systems and really determining how each of their normals differed, we were able to better customize each one. Our thresholds needed to be correspondingly different for each some were intentionally catching any abnormal spikes that were even the tiniest above the maximum range of normal, as you can see with the first two products in this example. You can see the, the very top spikes, it's just like right on top of those. And one is intentionally much looser because throughput spiking for that particular application happens to not impact the rest of the system or impact customers, which means it's only worth alerting on two of those products during that additional spike um, that we're seeing all of them have at 9.45 a.m. 
Other considerations included whether you have upstream apps that produce data on a schedule like this, and what if they decide to change that schedule? So really optimizing for having that communication process so you know what to expect if that normal changes. Or what if one team's product event time processing is based in UTC and the other in PST? Not saying this happened, but I'm saying that it can be more likely than you think if you're combining data from teams that may not have had to combine their data streams before. And what if one of those time zones does daylight savings and one doesn't? So really just getting your hands dirty, finding out what that normal spike looks like now and figuring out if you can tell if that spike is gonna move later and if it's gonna move later for some teams and not others. And figuring out what you're doing to, to ensure you're monitoring the right metrics in this case and that you ensure that you know what it means when those metrics are abnormal. And of course, if there's a new normal. So in both cases, with our relay race analogy and the new stream processing application, as I said, seeing that slowdown in progress might actually be okay, but I really wanna emphasize how valuable it was for us to really have that deep understanding of that normal pace or throughput and what that looks like, having that up in a place where you can see it, checking it regularly for each runner, as well as you know, for each application along your whole pipeline. So talking with those upstream teams, getting that very specific understanding of the flow of their application and really leveraging data-driven development principles, not just for pure code, but for analytics and for integration. This enabled us to get page less and to not dilute our alerting with unnecessary alarms, but it also enabled us to automate so many avoidable hurdles in integrating something that is so powerful and so fast into this ecosystem. In the end, I love working with such powerful stream processing frameworks because of that incredibly high performance. Frameworks like Pulsar and compatible streaming frameworks like Apache Flink have amazing features that can, and, and for us really did, solve a lot of really big, complicated problems. However, keeping up with something this fast and powerful can take some really creative readjustments to be able to have that successful integration into that pre-existing system. But take it from me, when you speed through that finish line, it is so worth it. So with that, thank you so much, everyone. Um, if you want to get a hold of me, please feel free to DM me on Twitter. Um, as Rosalie mentioned, my handle is also on the screen, Cato-200-OK. And it's also on my website. And I will eventually have a blog post about this. And I'm also in the Pulsar Slack. So I'd love to meet you all in there as well. So with that, thank you so much to Pulsar, to June, Rosalie, and conference staff, and to all of you who made it here. So. Fantastic. Yeah, if you want to stop sharing here. your slides real quick, we can see you on the big screen. Cool. Yes. Well, what a fantastic story. So um, there quick we note, so we, um, we're a little bit over time. So I'm going to encourage folks oh, who have questions um, to reach out to you on Twitter, reach out to you via email. Perfect. But I just really, really loved your presentation style. And I think you've inspired a lot of people to get outdoors and, you know, join a club and just get out there, get, get the Fitbits on, basically. Nice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Awesome. awesome. All right. Well, I'm going to quickly thank just you so much. Thank you. And let me clap for you because that was just fantastic <laughs> storytelling and just, just very engaging. Thank you. Thank you.